As a Linux user, have you ever wanted a Mac Mini? I mean, you could always go and get a Mac Mini. They actually run Linux now, which is kind of amazing. Uh, or maybe you wanted an Intel NUC. NUC? NUC. They were those cute little mini PC towers that Intel made a few years ago. But they stopped making them, apart from selling the shell to a few bespoke manufacturers who can still configure them. Well, I might have an interesting proposition for you because today we're looking at Geekom's Mini IT13. Uh, it is a mini tower that is uh, housing a stonkingly impressive 13th generation Intel i9 13900H. Yes, it's a laptop class processor, but it's one of the big beefy ones that you usually see coming in these massive gaming laptops. The interesting thing for me is that is this mini tower capable enough to do the things that I need it to do to run this channel, for example? Uh, and would it be capable enough for someone like yourself or someone who's into software development, graphic design, photography, uh, that kind of thing? I'm gonna go right ahead out of the gate and say that this is not a machine for gaming, unless of course you wanna do an external GPU, but by and large, it's just not built for it. What it is built for though, is for some pretty decent processor performance, very upgradable, well-built, and relatively well-optimized in a nicely machined package for a pretty compelling price. And I think that's where this product finds its sweet spot. So today's video is going to be uh, looking into this product a little bit further, and my opinions are 100% my own. However, Transparency Geekom did send me this unit to review. So keep that in mind as we go through the video, and also full transparency, the links in the description below are affiliate links. So keep that in mind as well. Let's jump into it. So let's get the basics out of the way. The Mini IT13 is based on, and it's almost identical to, the tall Intel NUC chassis. Uh, it's either the performance or the pro model. I can't really tell from images, but you can definitely see there's a very strong identity between the two. It weighs in at about 625 grams, and it's about a four by four inch or 10 and a half ish centimeter square motherboard. And it's enclosed in an aluminum casing. Uh, and all the port locations and cutouts are all basically the same as what we'd expected from an Intel NUC back in the day. However, it's what's inside that's quite compelling for the price that it is. And you can check the price at those links in the description below, and you can make your own decisions about whether this represents good value to you. But the model that I have with me at the moment for the price that it is being retailed at is very compelling. So like I mentioned at the top, it's a 13th gen i9 13900H uh, processor with a 45 watt TDP. Uh, it's 14 cores, 20 threads. Uh, six of those are performance cores that boost up to 5.4 gigahertz, eight efficiency cores up to 4.1 gigahertz. You've got your integrated uh, Iris Xe graphics. Uh, there's 32 gig of uh, DDR4 RAM at 3200 megahertz. Uh, this is expandable up to 64 gigabytes and the slots are easily accessible inside the casing, as is the storage options, which uh, this model comes with a uh, an M.2 SSD. Well, technically it's an M.22280 um, PCIe Gen 4 uh, SSD. It's a Lexar branded uh, SSD and it's two terabytes uh, in VME. Uh, there is a second M2 slot. It's the shorter 2242 slot. Um, and there is also a slot for a two and a half inch uh, SATA SSD. So the amount of uh, storage expansion on this thing is actually very decent for how small the device actually is. Um, you also, in terms of connectivity, get Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2, uh, which is, I think, relatively up to date with what we would expect from modern hardware. Um, obviously, it comes with Windows in most cases. In my testing, I haven't used Windows at all. I've just been using um, Linux Mint, uh, and that's what I've been using to make the last few videos uh, on this channel. Uh, and that's made up the predominant uh, amount of my testing. 
Now, when it comes to connectivity, uh, there are actually quite a few ports on this thing considering the size. And that's what I keep coming back to. I'm often using, in the past, I've often used the big beefy uh, gaming type laptops uh, with this class of processor in them. So I'm fairly familiar with the performance profile and the connectivity options that's associated with that form factor. Uh, however, compared to the laptop that I've used uh, in the recent months to run this channel, this actually outdoes it in terms of uh, connectivity, not to mention obviously the pricing of it is still very competitive to a budget um, you know, gaming laptop. So in terms of connectivity, crucially you get two USB-C Thunderbolt USB 4, uh, like 40 gigabit on the back, you get two HDMI 2.0s that can power up to uh, 4K displays. Then you also get a USB-A, uh, you get a 3.2 Gen 2, up to 10 gigabits on the back. Uh, you get another USB-A up to five gigabit on the back. You get a two and a half gigabit ethernet port. And then there's the 19 volt 6.3-ish uh, amp um, barrel AC adapter. The front panel, on the other hand, has another two USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports uh, with up to 10 gigabit um, pass through. And one of them has power pass through as well. So even when the device is off, you can still charge stuff with it. You have the combo, the 3.5 mil combo jack, and crucially for me, a SDXC card reader. Um, which again, in the video world or even in the photography world, very useful for uh, getting stuff off the camera quickly. So already on its surface it, with the connectivity uh, and also the spec, this is definitely outperforming the laptop that I was previously using. The question mark that I had in my head though, and the question that you might be asking is that how much of a performance dip am I going to lose out on not having a dedicated graphics card? Also, curiously enough, they have AMD offerings, which I'll be interested to see if I can get my hands on one of those and do a comparison between the 57, uh, what is it, the 5800H um, from AMD as opposed to the i9-13900. Uh, here. But let's just talk performance for a minute because while there are videos out there that have some really detailed benchmarks, I wanted to give you guys a bit of a, uh, a comparison here with how this thing performs on Linux specifically. So when it comes to the test uh, environment, I was using a 64-bit build of Linux Mint 21.2 uh, to do the majority of the testing. Uh, and I was using the Geekbench uh, suite as well as the Pharonix uh, benchmarking suite. And while I'm not going to reference all of the numbers here, because I think it just gets too daunting and there's better videos out there that can do that, just to give you a snapshot of the comparison between performance on Windows and performance on Linux. So for reference, while I haven't run the tests, the benchmarks on Windows 11, the, from what I can see out there on the internet, the people that have run the benchmarks on this specific model, they churn out a single core score on Geekbench 6.2.1 of 2,732 on the single core and 11,124 on the multi-core. Now, obviously Geekbench isn't all things to all people, but it is a good cross-platform reference of CPU power. So when I ran Geekbench 6.2.2 on Linux Mint, it churned out, uh, curiously enough, it churned out a significantly lower score the first time around. And I was wondering why that would be. Um, and what I actually found was that by default, Linux Mint's, uh, the power profile that it applies to the CPU is actually quite conservative. So while I was running these benchmarks, I wasn't hearing the fan spin up at all. And that was weird. So then I realized that perhaps the performance profile was su stuck on balanced or maybe even power save, because after all, this CPU is designed to be a laptop chip. So yes, indeed. After I jumped into CPU power GUI, I was able to select all the CPUs, switch the governor to performance. And at that point, the fans felt much more liberal in terms of spinning up and the performance increased drastically. So we went from uh, scores that were around 15 to 20% lower than what they were on Windows to scores that were slightly better. So on Windows, like I mentioned before, we're sitting at around 2,700 for the single score and 11,000 for the multi-core. On the single core side of things, even with performance mode on, Linux Mint wasn't able to bench quite as high. On the multi-core, however, it actually outperformed Windows. So don't know what's going on there, but it was an interesting observation.
Me from the future here. I did a little bit more digging on that one. Turns out while there is a mode in the BIOS that allows you to crank up the fan speed and by default it sits on a fairly conservative balanced profile, you can, when cranking up that fan speed, eke a little bit extra performance out of this CPU. But I would say that mounted in a proper cooling environment with fans that can really get up and go, I think you could definitely get a lot more power out of this CPU. I think the limitations of the small environment mean that the amount of energy and power that it's drawing from its 45 watt TDP means that you are kind of limited into how much this i9 can stretch its legs. So what this means is that comparative to other i9-3900Hs mounted in larger environments with a bigger power draw, it just means that the performance is kind of limited by the profiles that Geekom have dialed it in for, I'm guessing, noise and heat reasons. So the good news is it'll be very unlikely that you'll ever fry this chip, meaning that the long-term use case of this thing is looking pretty good. The three-year warranty helps with that as well. Um, but at the same time, you're not going to find the same performance profile for that exact CPU as you might on a larger heat displacement and larger power draw. I hope that clarifies some things. When it comes to the gaming performance of this thing, look, honestly, it's not designed for it. It can do it if pushed. Some of the reports out there that I was seeing about titles like Cyberpunk 2077 uh, reckon that you can get 1080p at low settings at around 35 frames a second. In my own testing anyway, I looked at the benchmark results from a Spaceship Visual Effect Graph demo uh, available on Steam. It runs in the Unity engine. And as you can see here, this is kind of like my, uh, my benchmark here on the laptop that I usually use to run the channel. Uh, so we're sitting here at an average of 109 frames per second with an RTX 3060. Uh, bear in mind that the generation of processor that we're running here is significantly worse than what we're dealing with. But just for reference, where you have the, uh, the benchmark results here for graphics um, on the Iris XE graphics, we're looking at an average of like a quarter of that, uh, 24.2 frames a second. So hopefully that should be able to give you enough to level expectations appropriately. Uh, at the end of the day, this thing's strength is in sheer processing power. And that's where things get interesting from my point of view. So overall, the use case for me with this product is can I use it to run the channel, edit the videos, and do the things that I need to do. So in terms of office work, absolutely, this thing's gonna fly, no doubt about it. When it comes to video editing, the question that I had in my mind is, will Caden Live be able to make good use of all of the cores that it has available? Now, if you're not in the video editing world, then this isn't gonna make a whole lot of sense to you. But if you are, when it comes to video editors, there's a delicate balance between CPU speed and GPU speed. Because a lot of uh, proprietary video editors make really good use of dedicated GPUs, you can often get uh, GPU accelerated rendering and also special effects. Now, the video editor that I use, Caden Live, is only just starting to get its teeth into proper GPU acceleration. So it doesn't really bother me too much that in this case, I am using a just a beefy CPU without a GPU. So when it comes to timeline performance, I find that the uh, the CPU does a fantastic job of uh, just keeping up with the speed at which I'm making any edits that I need to make. Uh, when it comes to the overall uh, render time difference, what I did was I compared the rendering time with a NVIDIA GTX 1060 on my laptop with the i9 inside here. And what I found was interesting in that if I use the built-in bog standard H.264 rendering profile, I noticed that the performance is going to be significantly faster um, due to the fact that the video editor relies predominantly on the CPU to use that rendering profile. However, if I use one of the hardware accelerated options, which it's not gonna let me uh, select the NVIDIA ones because of the fact that the NVIDIA drivers aren't here, uh, then I do get some decent performance out of my dedicated graphics card on my laptop. Uh, the issue is here that can I use the Intel VAAPI profile to eke out a little bit of performance from the Iris XE integrated graphics? Uh, well, the short answer is you can, but it's actually turns out to be just more efficient to just let the CPU run and do its thing. So 
This is what it all boils down to in my mind when it comes to the overall render times on Caden Live of my average Infinitely Galactic video project, I get about 30% faster render times than I do with the NVENC codex on my NVIDIA GPU in my laptop. So all of that to say, the CPU in this is giving me faster render times than the GPU in my laptop. Not really that much of a shocker, but considering the power profile that both of these devices run is very, very similar, the power draw that they have at idle, this thing consumes around 21 watts of, of power. When I'm absolutely gunning it when it comes to uh, rendering something, uh, I get anywhere between about 70 watts all the way up to 90 watts if it's absolutely pegged, but I wasn't able to keep it at 90 watts for very long. Uh, it sat mostly in the 70 to 80 watts range, depending on what I was doing. Um, it is worth mentioning that when it comes to compilation times, uh, I ran the FFmpeg compile benchmark from the Pharonix testing suite, and that returned a score of, on average, 54.87. Now, when you line that up in comparison with other leading CPUs out there that are desktop class, it isn't that much to write home about. But when you consider the size of these desktop class chips, the size of the motherboards that encase them, and the size of the towers that encase that, you realize you're making a pretty significant trade-off in the amount of space it takes up to do things compared to a mini tower. And that's where I'll leave this video. At the end of the day, I think this is a very solid value for money, well-built and well-connected piece of kit with up-to-date components and plenty of upgradability, uh, especially for the price. So who is this thing for? Well, it's somebody who just needs strong processor performance in an itty bitty package. I could see myself using one of these for about the next three to five years with having plenty of expandability for more RAM and storage should I need it, but it's got more than enough RAM and storage for what I need right now. And if you're an office user, photo editor, uh, software developer, web developer, as long as you're not a gamer or someone that relies on heavy 3D rendering capabilities, uh, this thing is going to do what you need it to do pretty darn quick and for a whole lot less money than a Mac mini. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments below and I'll see you all in the next one.